All right, we're gonna we're gonna have an uh, exciting night here, um, and uh, I think we're gonna get right into it. Okay. Absolutely. So you are Jordan Allett. Okay. And I'm Dan Allett. Okay. All right. So we, you got these guys are twins. Yeah. <laughs> I identical, they tell us. <laughs> so. You're probably wondering who's older. Uh. <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so you guys have got a project called Trump's America. Um, how did that come about? Well, uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's called the Race to 2020, and it's basically our attempt to better understand the people and places that put Donald Trump in the White House. And... Um, for us personally, I think after the election, it was pretty clear that many people in the media uh, got the election wrong. They didn't anticipate the rise of Donald Trump or his election victory. And it seemed like a lot of uh, journalists sort of dismissed Trump voters, casting them aside and dismissing them as, as, as racist and bigoted and deplorable. And that just didn't ring true to, to Jordan and me. We, we thought... You know, we know people who are Trump voters, people who we uh, are in our family, people we love, people we admire, people we respect and know are thoughtful, intelligent people who ended up voting for Trump. And so this project is sort of, first of all, we, we knew we needed to get out of Washington and to do some reporting in other places throughout the country. So we said we're trying to kind of reconcile two, two views of the Trump voter, one as the backward uh, racist, I ignorant person, and then our knowledge of our friends and family who are, are good people, people we admire. And so that's how it came about. And, and, and another thing we wanted to do, not only through written articles, but through photos and through video, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker myself, is to kind of give a voice to people in parts of the country that often feel like they've been uh, ignored or misunderstood by, by other parts of the country or by the media. And so we wanted to go and kind of give, give them a voice to say, okay, what are your priorities? What are your challenges in your area of the country, in your communities? So that, you know, this is kind of a mission of understanding. We're trying to go yeah. in with humility and give them a voice, amplify their voice. And I, th I think inevitably that's going to help everybody understand each other better. Yeah, and the idea is we, we have nine counties in nine different states that we're traveling to and spending, I'm, I'm on the road full time, so I'm spending a month or so each year in each location and to get to know people to, uh, and then to follow them over time to find out how their views may change, their economic conditions, how they uh, view the Trump presidency, other things going on in the culture and politics. Um, so, you know, I think that'll be, it's kind of what academics might call a longitudinal study. So you're taking the same, we're going to go back to the same churches, the same bars, talk to the same people over four years. You can find out a lot about how, how uh, President Trump is doing. So uh, tell, uh, I'm a journalist, so I want to understand the mechanics of how all this works. Uh, do you spend, how long do you spend in each place? Who, how do you decide who you're going to talk to? Mm. Uh, what, what, what sorts of information are you, are you trying to get? Well, uh, we started a bit late in the first year, but generally we're spending about a month in each location. I'll go in and I'll contact, really I'm looking to talk to pretty much anybody, <laughs> not you know, politicians, activists. I'll, I'll find out wh which issues are important and try to look, look people up in those areas. But also just the man on the street, the woman at the church, the man at the end of the bar who I want to talk to, um, and just really anyone who's willing to talk because we want to give voice again, not just to, I mean politicians you know, are pretty willing to talk and activists but we also want to give voice to ordinary people. And a lot of the places we go to, we found a lot of the rural areas. I mean, if Orange County, California is one, one county that we're going to, and obviously there's a lot going on there, or Macomb County in Michigan. But a lot of the rural areas, uh, they don't have as much going on, so we try to hit bigger events. So we were in Howard County, Iowa, which is interesting because it had uh, supported uh, Barack Obama by 21, uh, I think 21 percentage points, 2012 and then swung to Donald Trump by over 20 percentage points in the last election. That's a 40 point swing. That's interesting. It's a very rural area though and there's not as much going on but we, we went there for their big uh, summer fair or county fair and just talked to people, everyday people about, about their conditions, about their hopes and dreams, about their challenges 
and obviously about uh, you know their their stances on political issues too. Right, right. So you're going to visit these nine counties, and you started in May of this year. Right. Okay, and you spend a month straight in one place? It's more or less, uh, three weeks um, sometimes. And now we're going to be kind of crisscrossing. So if, if there's an event in, in Michigan, we may go for two days and then come back to somewhere. But Yeah, uh, f for example, I, this last weekend I was in Howard County, and Iowa is a very rural area, and I, was, I went hunting for the first time in my life with a group of 10 men. Um, obviously, guns are a big issue now and always, uh, but it was the opening of, of their pheasant uh, hunting season. And so I went there to spend time with them, to talk to them about that issue, but just to get a better sense of their community. So I just went in for the weekend, but we'll, we'll hit events as they come up throughout yeah. the years. And the project started out, I was going to do it while still working in the newsroom, uh, go for just like a long weekend once a month. But then I, I figured, you know, to really get people to open up and to meet a lot of people and to find out what's really going on, I think it takes building up some cultivating goodwill and trust in the communities. And if I'm only there for two days, people, you know, they, they don't like that when a, a journalist comes in and leaves and doesn't really have a good sense of what's going on. So I, I feel like at the end of four years, I will have been in each place maybe three or four months. So that's pretty good. I, I feel confident that I'll have a good sense of what's going on at that point. You'll know the name of the, the servers at the local diners. Yes, exactly. I already do, in fact, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how do you guys divide up the work? Well, I'm the writer, and he does film and photography, so that's pretty simple. So the work that you guys do about both appears, uh, appears online, but both in, in, uh, is written text, but also w with video, right? Yeah, and it's, it's important to do the video, I think. Right, right. I think people, when they, when you, when, uh, you know, for me as a filmmaker, I've spent 15 years as a filmmaker uh, working on a lot of domestic uh, political issues, but also international human rights. And it's difficult sometimes to get somebody in the West, in the United States, to connect with, let's say, a political prisoner in Cuba or an ethnic and religious minority in the Middle East. But when you see them on screen and you can hear them talk and talk about their family and you see their environment, it's just a lot easier to connect with them. And, and in the same way, we're going to places that might seem very foreign to other parts of the country. And so we want them to be able to speak in their own voice and show us, not just tell us, show us their life. And that's where, obviously, the video and the photos really helps out. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna do a thing, we're gonna do a little video, but let me ask you a question, hopefully that will lead to the video. So one of the places that you guys have been to is Robeson County in North Carolina, and you, you, th you say that is the most uh, uh, racially diverse rural county yeah. in the United States. Uh, what did you find there? Well, uh, yeah, Robinson County is the, the poorest county in North Carolina out of the 99, I believe, that there are in North Carolina, the most racially diverse in the whole country of the rural counties. And it's 70% minority, 40% um, are Lumbee Native American. Lumbee is a tribe. And in 2012, they supported Barack Obama by over 10 percentage points. 2016, they voted for uh, Donald Trump by five percentage points. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of that county before, but that seems like an interesting story that the, the, the most racially diverse rural county in the country supported Donald Trump. Even if you don't like Donald Trump, whether you do or you don't, you'd think you'd want to go there and find out what's going on. Um, we met a lot of people who were the Obama-Trump voters who had obviously supported Obama and then went to Trump. One individual is Mark Locklear, and I'll show you a quick video uh, clip of him. Uh, He's explaining see. why he voted for Obama and then to Trump. Uh, sorry. Yep. That's not it. He explained to us why he and others he knows voted for Trump last November. He, he talked about draining the swamp in Washington. Uh, he, he is not a politician. He is caught by the politician. Uh, and Obamacare has resonated with a lot of people, the working class. All our premiums has skyrocketed. Those of us are self-employed that has to maintain insurance, it hurts, it hurts. And uh, he talked about repealing and replacing Obamacare. That resonated with me. So one interesting thing about Mark that really stands out visually for me is, and I'll show you quickly, is, uh, I don't know if you notice anything in this picture, but back here over his shoulder, you have a bobblehead of Barack Obama. You have a framed picture of the Obama family. Mark worked for the Democratic Party, and you know, he's a lifelong Democrat, but he voted for, for Trump. I think there are thousands, 
tens of thousands of people like Mark Locklear all over the country. So this project is about finding them and talking to them and trying to understand where they're coming from. Yeah, and he, he, used, this is on, he used the word hope. He's, he's not a huge fan of Trump, but he's putting his hope in Trump. And that word, we, we did a little video, we won't show it now, but we asked people in each county um, to try and sum up in one word why they think Trump won in their county. And we heard lots of words like jobs and courts and Hillary and things like that. But the two words we heard more than any other were hope and change. And so that contrasts, I think, with the media, the pre prevailing media narrative, which was, uh, you know, tr Trump was all about hatred and fear and doom and gloom. For a lot of voters, including some Obama voters, he was the candidate of hope. And yeah, I, I actually didn't realize this that until I got to Harvard. Uh, something that, that my Shorenstein colleague Donna Brazil undoubtedly understood that there was a number of people or a significant number of people who voted for Obama in 2016 and this was probably a surprise, it was a surprise to me and perhaps many others voted for Trump in 2016 uh, after yeah. voting for Obama previously and your best explanation as you out, out there in the field talking to people is, is Yes, well, yeah, there were over 200 counties that voted for Obama twice and then switched to Trump. And so some of that is different voters. So some voters who, who showed up for Obama didn't in 2016. And Trump brought out a, new, a lot of, of new voters as well. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's that hope. I guess, how else would you? Yeah, no, that, that was a I, surprising takeaway. Well, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of people in DC um, were, you know, a lot of people in politics and journalism are very ideological, and we think the whole country is very ideological. But we talk to a lot of people who just, they, um, they like a candidate. There's a charisma about a candidate that they're attracted to, and their policy uh, views are almost secondary, so they'll be attracted to that candidate, and then they'll embrace the policy views second. All right, and by the way, I'm gonna go about another 20 minutes or so, and then we'll take um, uh, questions from you all. Um, you found something interesting in Robeson County, again in North Carolina. 40% of the residents there are on Medicaid, right? And yet that was a county that voted for Trump. Can you explain that from your conversations with people there? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if that's, that's the number, um, but there are a lot of people on government assistance in some of these places. We're just in Grant County, uh, West Virginia, which is, which is known for that, and people complain about it. It's a big issue among uh, people we interviewed, they say that's the biggest issue, too many people on the dole. Um, but some of them are still voting for Trump. So there is, I think, sort of a cognitive dissonance there a little bit. But I think there are issues that supersede um, the size of government and, and welfare programs. A lot of people voted for Trump just for uh, reasons of national identity. They feel like, now I can, I can be proud of my country again. We have a leader who is defending American interests, and whether they're right or wrong, that's how they feel. Somebody who's gonna be standing boldly for, for our country. And I think a lot of these communities too, if you look at the Lumbee Native Americans, historically they're, they vote Democrat um, and, and supported Barack Obama quite a bit, but on social issues, they're, they're pretty conservative. They say, you know, faith and family. Anything that gets in the way of faith and family is, is, is gonna be a problem for them. Good. I want to go right into that because sure. I've made a question uh, that, I, that you, you quoted a guy in Wisconsin who said uh, they value tradition, talking about the Trump supporters, they, uh, they value tradition, faith, hard work, and law and order. This is what the fellow in Wisconsin told you. And I made a note to myself, uh, how do these voters square that view with the fact that Trump fooled around on his first two wives, was heard on the Hollywood Access tape uh, saying he groped women, uh, he doesn't have a record of attending church. He, he owned casinos. Yep. And he has a record of stiffing contractors. So how do these voters that you talk to square all of that? Well, I think uh, conservative Christians went all in for Trump overall in the last election, more so than they did for Romney or McCain or even George W. Bush. And that, that would seem strange given who Trump is. Um, but And what do they tell you? Uh, he's somebody who's going to stand up for us. Now, he was an, an example of, of that. Uh, was a couple of week weekends ago, Trump gave a speech at the Values Voters Summit. And this is a collection of, of Christian, conservatives, uh, evangelicals, pretty big event in Washington. 
And he made a gaffe during, during a speech. He called the governor of uh, Puerto Rico, the president of Puerto Rico. And a lot of the, the attention in the media was on that gaffe. Oh, you know, here's another reason why um, he doesn't, he's unsuitable to be president. But if you actually read his speech, it's a reminder of why he won. He was talking again about we need to honor our first responders and our military and our police. We need to honor the flag. We need to protect the dignity of all human life. And, oh, and, and, and prayer. We can, why don't we start with a prayer? Now, you could say, wow, that's very cynical um, to, for, of Trump and to be, for people to be voting for him. But even th they realize he's not a Christian um, and hasn't lived a Christian life. But he's the first politician, first Republican, who has been unapologetic about defending Christian America in their, in their viewpoint. And even George W. Bush never showed up at that event. In eight years, he, he sent Dick Cheney. So here's Trump actually going and acknowledging them, going to their event and giving that type of speech. They love and, it. And I think Mike Pence also helped to justify the, the pick as well. A lot of evangelicals especially, or conservative Catholics and others, once he was selected, it was like, okay, now I feel a little bit better about, about voting for him. And, and a lot of people would, would tell me before the election when they'd say, well, I don't really like Trump, but uh, he, you know, they, they would talk about the Supreme Court. Yeah. They that's said huge. that is something that's going to you know, affect us for a long time, for decades ahead. And if he picks the right person for the openings coming up, then, then that, that justifies yeah. my vote. There are many, many conservative Catholics and Christians and, and conservatives generally who feel like no matter what Trump does, short of starting a war, um, and maybe not, um, his selection of, of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court vindicated and validated their vote for him. Even, and these are people who had a lot of qualms about Trump on the character issue. So in my initial question, what led you to, to undertake this, Dan? You, you cited that the, the media got it wrong. Uh, did the media get wrong last year because of liberal bias? Um, liberal bias, I think, I think it's, liberal bias is real. I think that's, it's hard to argue that. But there are also a lot of conservative news outlets out there now that also got the election wrong. Um, a lot of people at the Examiner got it wrong. We didn't know, uh, very few people saw it coming. And I think it's a very insular environment. We're inside the Beltway. I've lived there for 15 years. Jordan's lived there for 13 years now. And so, yeah, that, that was what prompted me to say, well, let, let's get out and start reporting full-time from the rest of the country. And I'm always surprised at how many members of the media there are who don't know somebody personally and uh, respect somebody who voted for Trump. Like, they don't have to like what they, you know, that they voted for Trump, but there are a lot of members of the media who are supposed to be talking about issues that affect the whole of the country, who haven't been anywhere outside of the, the two coasts, and who don't know anybody that voted for Trump. So it's easy to make them the other, or to demonize this group of people. And again, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like, you can demonize Donald Trump, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's sort of not the right thing to do to demonize all of his supporters, especially when you don't know them. Right, so you both have backgrounds as working with conservative, uh, I'm sorry, Christian nonprofits and for conservative publications. Mm -hmm. uh, are you guys uh, traditional objective journalists? Probably not, I worked in opinion for 15 years. Um, and I, come at this as somebody who's saying, we have too much opinion in Washington. It's time for some more straight reporting. And I, I think if more journalists acknowledge that, yeah, there's probably going to be opinion um, and uh, subjectivity coming into my writing. I'm selecting stories that are interesting to me. That's subjective. I'm talking to certain people. Um, I have my opinions, issues that I really care about. Um, and so it is reporting with, with, with uh, some opinion as well. And I will say, Dan at the Examiner was maybe the most outspoken uh, writing against Donald Trump early on. And so yeah. even though, and we don't, we don't really publicize you know, where we are politically, but neither one of us are on either end of the spectrum. Yeah, uh, it's, we, it's, We've been critical of Donald Trump now and, and, and previously as well. Yeah, it's funny because right now a lot of what we're doing is explaining why and how he won. So a lot of people are like, oh, like, you know, Facebook and on social media say, oh, you guys must be pro-Trump. But it, we're explaining why he won, so it's going to come across as pro-Trump. But, it's, you know, we're just, this is what happened. So everyone's going to see what they want in it. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you, um, you had a couple of uh, African-American voters in Macomb County. Mm. 
uh, if you want to just talk about what what they said. Yeah, if you want to actually, they they have a little. There's a little clip there. It, you know, we just find a lot of nuance among the people we meet. Every time, I think that I have something figured out, or I or I've perceived like a trend. Um, somebody will come along and sort of bust it. Um, and anyway, th these two we have George on the left and and uh, and Daryl, and they just agreed. George is a Trump voter on the left, and and uh, he's a an Obama Trump voter. Daryl is a Romney. Clinton voter, um, and we just found them uh, just randomly, and they were they had just a lot of nuance in what they were saying about um, Trump right. and about race. Now this one is about we just asked them straight up: Do you think Trump is a racist? Donald Trump is a racist. I don't. I I can't go as far as to say he's a racist. I can say he's definitely uh, maybe maybe race insensitive. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, I, would, uh, yeah. I, I won't go as far as to call him a racist, uh, but but he is uh, a couple other things. Uh. <laughs> Do you think he's just really insensitive to everybody, and race is one of the things that he's insensitive about, or like, yeah? I mean, that's that's fair. That's fair absolutely. to yeah. That's fair to say that he's insensitive about a lot of things, and race is one of them. Um, but you know he's a he's a seventy year old man that you know lived through a time where black people weren't equal to him. And he was by law. <laughs> he was taught that black people and poor people were not equal to him because like, like you said, it's not just race; it's right. it's everything. Donald Trump, he just he just gives off this air of arrogance, you know. But Good. I don't think he's a we racist. Had that do you? I know you got some more clips. Do you? Uh, do you want to show another one with a with a uh, with with a, oh, a different point of view, a white person talking about Maybe David why Moore, they like Trump? Yeah, this, we found a, a, a young man who worked in manufacturing. Um, not a really political guy. He said he probably would have voted for Obama last in 2012. But he talked about why his whole manufacturing plant ended up voting for Trump. Okay, and excuse the video. We were kind of secretly uh, filming in an Applebee's. Yeah, they didn't appreciate that, but we had to get it done. So this is from Erie, Pennsylvania? Erie, Pennsylvania, sorry. Yeah. I know firsthand from just my division when I worked in here in Erie, um, of 125 employees out of three shifts, every single one of us voted for Trump for the same reason. We want to change. We were pretty much standing as a shop saying we want to see something different. We don't want the same political promises that don't hold up. And Trump was very, very persistent through his campaigns that he was going to bring that change that a lot of us lower class working, you know, families were, you know, trying to find. Actually, this was my first year voting. So, um, to be honest, back in 2012, I probably would have still voted for Obama. But... I would say off the top of my head, I would know of at least 10 different plastic shops that went under in this area. So, and a lot of those employees were there for many years and a lot of jobs were being uh, pushed across seas for cheaper labor. Um, so a lot of people were pretty much done with that, um, that era. Um, uh, politicians telling us what we want to hear just so that way they can get into office and then when they get in there they don't stick to it and that's it's interesting he, he kind of speaks David Moore speaks to that um, valuing authenticity and obviously everybody wants uh, a politician to be genuine to be sincere authentic but I mean I was just last uh, last weekend in in uh, Howard County in Iowa uh, going hunting for the first time in my life in, in one of the counties that, that we're uh, following with a group of 10 men. And it's interesting, having lived in, in Washington, D.C., because we, you know, I, my friends, I think, are pretty genuine people, but there's, there's always a, a pretension about the people in, in Washington, D.C. that you notice when you go to a place like rural Iowa. The people are not sensitive. They're not politically correct when they talk to their friends and their family. Um, they let their opinions be heard, but they're authentic. And so somebody like Donald Trump comes to them, and they don't agree with everything he says or the way he says it, but they're like, wow, at least you're being genuine. At least you're telling me you know, what you think 
and you're going to, you know, we believe you're going to act on it. At least you're giving us that respect to not lie to us because they, they feel like they've been lied to over and over again. And even in the primaries, when you stacked up Trump versus the other Republicans, he was the only one that came across as authentic. And I think if more Donald Trump would not be in office today, if more politicians actually said what they believed and acted on what they said. Well, interesting. Uh, a lot of elected officials or candidates say maybe what they believe and then they get hammered and so th then they they choose to follow what the consultants say and the and and what the polling says and for some reason trump has been able to to break that mold or disrupt it um so the, the idea of of uh, this guy is different he's gonna uh, you've been to how many counties so far been to, uh, six of them six counties okay no. So thus far, Trump has, I guess, one legislative triumph, which is getting uh, a Supreme Court uh, uh, nominee on the court. Um, is that, do you have a sense that, the, that his failures with Congress, which is his own political party, is, do you have a sense of that, is that pulling people away from Trump? Um, no, no. We, I've talked to, I've only, I only know one person who voted for him who, is ambivalent about uh, voting for him again. I, I, I've been asking people with the anniversary of his election win approaching whether they would vote the same way. And everyone, um, whether they voted for him or not, say they would vote the same way. And most of his supporters are very happy with what he's doing to the extent that they're not happy with what's going on legislatively and so forth. They blame Congress, and particularly Republicans in Congress. In fact, there was a, a poll a couple weeks ago, about a week ago, that showed Trump's approval rating among, among Republicans is about 85%, which is pretty good. Uh, it's, very, it's very good. Yeah, among Republicans. Yeah, and, and Congress, the Republican Congress's uh, approval rating among Republicans is 65%. So we talk to per people all the time. They say, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, they're to blame. Yeah, he sort of set himself up as being you know, something different than the two parties. Uh, he's, he's been masterful in, in that way. And I, we met a lot of people who would vote for, again, who are Democrats, who would vote for Trump and then vote Democrat the rest of the ticket. So he, he's kind of separated himself as being the one that goes against the parties, ag obviously against the establishment, against the media, and, and, and also as the victim of those establishments as well. Right. Okay. And I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then open it up to you all. So um, be thinking what, kind of, what question you want to ask uh, these guys. Um, well, what about uh, the, 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 the in indictment, uh, uh, Manafort and, and the other fellow uh, uh, I I and one of the other guys, uh, George, uh, has ple pleaded guilty. It, now, you, you haven't had a chance to speak, to ask the voters what they think of this, but based on your previous interviews, do you have a sense that this, this whole issue of Russia and these indictments is, is, is going to pull down Trump in any way? No. Short answer and long answer. <laughs> no. You're pretty, you're pretty sure about that. Yeah, among the people, we, again, this is it's not a random sample. It's not a large. It, it's getting to be a large ramp, uh, sample size. But um, um, among the people that we've talked to, for the most part, I, I think it won't matter at all. They'll say, I mean, like Trump said, this happened well before he was my campaign manager. So, what does that have to do with me? And whether that's right or wrong, um, that's I, I think that won't affect anyone's perception of him or ultimately their vote. <laughs> Okay, um, this will be my last question before, and, and then take questions. Um, has there been anything particularly for either of you guys that has particularly surprised you uh, in the in the time that you've been out there? I understand you're going to be out there till 2020, so you still got a lot of time to go. But that thus, at this point so far, any big surprises? Well, and this might you might assume this to be true, but I was surprised at how much I heard this from from people of different communities around the country, which is how much they really detest, uh, you know, the political parties or national candidates, uh, especially in, in the media, especially or even Hollywood, dictating to them and their communities what issues they should care about. So, oh, you live in North Carolina, then you should care about the transgender bathroom situation. And they're like, well, we don't have jobs. I can't feed my family. And you don't show any empathy towards the situation in my community, but you're telling me from the outside, and you've never been here, what issues I should care about. Um, I think sometimes empathy is sort of a zero-sum game. And so they're, they're saying, look, here's a candidate who's actually going to, who says at least that they're going to care about these issues that are important to my community and my family. 
Um, so that surprised me how many times we heard that. Yeah, and it's not necessarily a surprise, but it was striking. Um, being in the, in the Midwest for most of the summer, in the rural Midwest, how many uh, Midwestern Democrats feel like the party has gone too far to the left on issues including guns, abortion, and some other issues? Um, and one guy put it really well. We have a video, but we need to show it. He just said... Well, you want to just show it real quick? Oh, sure, okay. it's a short clip. Yeah. It's, 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 he summed it up pretty well. And this is somebody who met in, in Iowa. This is at the, Howard, the mighty Howard County Fair. The reason I didn't vote as a Democrat, and I am a resi registered Democrat, was I felt like they're no longer the party that they were 30 years ago. I feel the Republican Party is more like the way the Democratic Party was back 30 to 40 years ago. Yeah, so it's a, it's a short clip, but we heard that a lot, especially on social issues, that a lot of Democrats who have been, you know, their families have been Democrats, their whole community has been they've voted Democrat, and they feel like they, they have nothing in common with the progressive wing of the party. Yeah, and another, I can't um, say enough how important hunting and gun rights are for a lot of people, in, in, again, in, the, in the, a lot of places. But Democrats and Republicans. And, and, it, and it, it crosses ideological lines. And we, we talked to a state senator in Wisconsin, a Democrat and a former dairy farmer, who put it really well. And I'll just read her quote when she's talking about the importance of hunting to the culture and what it means to people. I heard over and over again uh, from election judges that if Hillary won, people would not be able to fill their freezer. This is really important in a rural area because people do hunt for food, and they have for generations. It's not just Republicans. That's the way people live, so I think that's import, uh, an important part of our culture. And that's why Bernie Sanders did well with a lot of those people, too, because he was much more in support of, of guns than Hillary was. Right. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to go to questions. We've got three rules. If you've been here before, you know what those rules are, but if you haven't, I'm going to say them. Um, please identify yourself and um, try to keep your question short, and it should end with a question mark. All right, so we'll go over here first. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Teddy. I'm a uh, sophomore here at the college. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I'd like to ask a question about race and how you engage with that in your research. Um, so often the way Americans talk about race is in a very subtextual way. Um, they might not say you know, their actual attitudes about a group of people or something like that, but they might refer to the inner cities or to um, you know, the, the terrorists, and that's supposed, that in some ways has a meaning associated uh, with a racial prejudice. So as researchers, how do you engage with um, what people say and try to extract the deeper meanings from it? Um, and did you have any interesting findings in that area? Um, that's a good question. We, we, we find it best to really try and spend as much time with people because that's an issue that oftentimes it takes a while before you can bring those topics up. Um, but w one thing I will say is that we, we've met people who are always, they seem to defy stereotypes um, all the time. We, and just one example, again, um, we met two uh, women, Syrian Muslim refugees in Erie, uh, who were very, who were fascinating. And at the, this was last year, and I didn't get a ch we didn't get a chance to talk really about politics. But this year, I was trying to canvas our focus group on, on on Trump a year after his election. And one of the women emailed back and said, "Yeah, I'd vote for Trump." Um, and that that was it was kind of strange, perhaps. But she, she said it was all about jobs and economic uh, issues. And so, um, and, and the other thing too, I think there's a perception oftentimes in, um, in big cities and on the coasts that people living in Appalachia or in the South or even the Midwest, if you're an, a minority of any, any type, you're gonna be discriminated against. Uh, and we've, we've talked to, and sure there is some of that, of course, there's a truth to that. But a lot of people that we've met, black, uh, you know, Middle Eastern, Hispanic, they feel very welcomed in their communities. Um, so I think that's an important point for people to know. All right. All right. Thanks, Teddy. Great question. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Jackson. I'm a sophomore at the college as well. Um, I was just wondering about um, single issue or self-interested voters. Um, how have you kind of navigated 
um, or I guess what are the what are the main kind of self-interest politics that um, you find, um, and is it consistent? Um, or is is support for for Donald Trump consistent um, just because of those self-interested kind of um, ideas, or um, how 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 is that working out? You mean I mean jobs? Yeah. That's a self-interested position. Yeah. Being pro job if you don't if you can't find work. Yeah, I guess. Um, I, I, I guess my question is, um, have you seen that people are voting mainly on the basis of jobs or of their economic status? No, I think it, I think it differs for everyone. There are millions of people who vote on the Supreme Court. There are millions of people who vote on jobs. Obviously, if you don't have a job, then that that will probably be your main, um, you know, main interest. But it, it really it really changes. It really it really differs. I think overall and at a at a fundamental level, it is about a feeling. It's about a feeling that you have for a candidate and some, a charisma that they have or don't have, and whether you're attracted to them. And I do think people say, okay, I'm attracted. There's something about this him or her that I like. And and then sec secondly, they, they 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 think about policy. And I think it's a good question because a lot of the counties that we went to obviously are counties that swung from voting for, for Obama and then voting for Trump. And so there are a lot of these sort of independents that are out there that could be won over by either party or either ca candidate. Um, you know, you're gonna find people who let's say are, are th their number one issue is you know, ab abortion, either pro-life or pro-choice, right? And so they're, they're gonna vote and they're gonna justify their vote either way. Um, but we still wanna get to know them because there are other issues Especially when it comes to like the primary. Well, did you support Donald Trump in the primary? If you had other pro-life candidates, or you know, if you're pro-choice, you know, who did you support? Um, so, but a lot of the people, you know, the ideal person that we talk to is, is somebody who's a bit more of an independent thinker who might uh, might be swayed as time goes on, and we you know we want to follow them. Yeah, what, to, to follow up on on Jackson's question, there there is a debate uh, among people who study. Who, are st who have studied the election was was the economic issue more important for Trump, or was it a sense of identity that that they were sort of losing their country? And I don't know if you have gotten. A, a I definitely set. think the latter. Uh, he's somebody who would boldly defend uh, American interests. Um, he's somebody who wouldn't apologize for America, as for a lot of people, Obama was perceived as have, having done. Um, even even Mark Locklear, who was still is a fan of Obama, he he said that that was an issue for him. That right. He liked the fact that that Trump was a bit more on the international stage. You know that he would expect him to be more pro-America. And, right. and and the, and the wall is, and immigration would fit into that too. Oh, sure. So I don't think it's an either or, but I do think national identity and just a, a feeling about a president and knowing that um, that they're out for their country's best interests and it, it resonates with people. And also uh, the economy, it always surprises me because I you know. People who are really into politics tend to, to focus on certain issues that are important to them that are more sort of theoretical issues that might not even affect them as much as jobs. I mean, I, living in Washington, D.C., they often say that you're kind of immune to recession. And you know, it's a big city. There are plenty of opportunities there. But when you go to rural areas, there aren't as many opportunities. So, you know, one, one big business leaving the area because of some policy is really going to affect you. You might lose your job. All of a sudden, there's uh, higher unemployment. Then there's cr more crime. There's more drugs. All you know, the education level goes down. It really can devastate a community much more than I I realized. All right, up here. Hi, uh, my name's Remy, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, in your last response, you talked a little bit about the feeling that some voters have for a certain candidate, um, and I think that in the 2016 election, there were a lot of Democrats that didn't like Hillary, and a lot of Republicans that didn't like Trump, um, and. In your research and in all the interviews that you were conducting, how do you parse out the difference between Democrats that didn't like Hillary and still voted for her, as opposed to Trump voters that never liked Trump but ended up voting for him? Where did you see that uh, those like decisions were different, and how were they similar, I guess, as well? Well, there are a lot of people in both camps. Yeah. I know that, as you say. Um, there, there are a lot of people who I thought would be, they, they kind of fit the... Uh, the caricature of a Trump voter who just said, no, I did, one guy just told me the other day, I did this, and everyone around me did. I, I held my nose and voted for Trump. They didn't like him, they didn't like his character, but they did it because the anti-Hillary sentiment, that was actually a bit of a surprise at how deep that was among Republicans, of course, but independents and, and some Democrats, too. And, and have you gotten a sense as to why they were so anti-Hillary? Did they talk about the emails? Did they talk All of about it, and, and just 30 years of having a record. She personifies establishment to them, 
right. and hypocrisy. Whether that's true or not, you can argue, but that's, that's the way they saw it, and so that really worked well when you, you contrast it to uh, her to Trump. All right, thanks. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a senior at the college. So obviously there are these people, as you mentioned, that are sort of very anti-media, distrustful of people that live in D.C. So how do you sort of come to them as like members of the media that also live in D.C. and sort of get them to talk to you and be willing to share sort of their actual feelings about the election? Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, is, it has been a challenge at times to get people to talk. Um, a lot of the counties are kind of famous, especially after the election. And so we've been there and there's, oh yeah, Politico came through or CBS News came through or the Wall Street Journal came through and they didn't do our story justice. They only told one side or they misrepresented who we are and they are really sensitive to that. And so we did lose some people that we wanted to talk to um, and they said, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go down that, that, that road again. Um, I think again, you know, the, the, the point of this project is to spend more time in the community. And I think if people see that we're there, and then once, you know, they, hopefully they read and watch what we're doing, um, they'll see that we are attempting to accurately portray their story. And we just really, you know, again, I have worked in opinion, but I really just want to be a medium through which people can tell their story to other Americans. And uh, how, how many stories are you trying to tell, or how many articles do you try to write from each um, month? We do, we do about three items a week. Um, it could so be short video. And they're, and they're short, right? A lot of them are yeah. short. Yeah, the, the, the columns are, you know, 800 to 1,200 words, but the, the videos a lot of times are two to three minutes. Um, they just make one point. Um, oftentimes, the same point that's being made in a column, but in a visual medium, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, where, we where that you, where you, you, if you're in a place for three weeks to a month, do you stay at an Airbnb? Do you stay with the family, oh, the, the logistics local? logistics are fun. Yeah, um, it, local it changes. holiday in. <laughs> if, if you're lucky, <laughs> uh, actually, you know what I found? I was just at a B and B for a, a month in in West Virginia, in rural West Virginia. That's the best place. A B and B. Yeah, every morning I got up and there's a different couple, like couples or something that are there that I can talk to, and they're usually from out of town. But you get to meet a lot more people doing that, and it's less lonely that way. I mean, come on, be, going to like ho some motel some, you know, somewhere every night, that, that can be lonely. And, and also people, e even though they're skeptical of the media, they appreciate that you're there. And they're friendly. I mean, I, you, if anybody goes to the Midwest or the South, I mean, I notice it every time I go. People are saying hi to me from you know, across the street. And I'm looking around like, I don't know who that person is. They're very friendly. So you know, there, there are opportunities there to build some goodwill. And over the long haul, people do open up. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you want to ask a question? Well, I'm sort of moving around. You're, you're next. So, I'm curious. Um, Wait, you got to identify yourself. So I'm Barbara, and I'm just doing a, sh a visiting. I'm doing a week's course here. And I'm um, just curious to what advice you would give to both candidates in the next election. Trump with his high approval rate to keep doing what he's doing. So what would you give, what advice would you give to the Democratic Party? Well, well, well I, I wouldn't necessarily give, you want to? Well, no, yeah, I, uh, I, I wouldn't give any advice to anyone, but... The advice, I've, we, we've asked each, each per, a lot of the people we've interviewed yeah. to, to, to even staunch, and I want to ask you a question, Trump supporters, if you could give the president one piece of advice, what would it be? And everyone, pretty much, has said the same thing. What do you think it is? Um, keep doing what you're doing. No, no, no. no but one criticism. It's one more person. of a criticism. Stop, what was it? Stop tweeting. Stop tweeting. Stop tweeting. Don't do the tweet. Don't tweet at all. Everyone says it. Even people who, who like that he's he's bold and sort of outspoken, they say he goes too far sometimes. And uh, but as far as advice goes, he, he was the, uh, the Democratic mayor of Erie. That that you know, and I think we've made this point before, but I, he, he makes it very well. Oop. We have audio here. You know, it always was. They were very very supportive of Bill Clinton very, very supportive of Hillary Clinton in 2008. You know, I talked to a lot of people, and I talked to a lot of the voters that I thought should have been in the Clinton camp, and uh, they were going Trump because they felt like uh, that was where opportunity lied. I think a lot of, I think a lot of it deals with, with candidates. Um, you know, I, I, I personally think that uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign overall was much stronger in 2008. This area has always been what we call Clinton country. But this time, uh, Hillary did not come here. Bill came 
three times. Uh, I think there was a couple of surrogates, but not a lot. Um, and Hillary didn't come. And it was noticed. And it was talked about within uh, the party and the voters. Um, I think it's still very, very much uh, an important part of any campaign and any candidate's success to service your constituents. You know, you still have to show them that, you know, their, their vote is, is important. Um, and, and as history now shows, uh, a lot of, of, of the hardcore Hillary supporters went the Trump route. And is that because she wasn't here to put forth that message as much as maybe she, she should have been? Um, I think that's part of it, especially in towns like this. Yeah, yeah we heard again and again from people um, in these places. Hillary didn't show up and Trump did. And Trump was holding big rallies, so it wasn't intimate, but he was there. And people really appreciate it. Another thing, too, in, in Robinson County, North Carolina, they were devastated by Hurricane Matthew about uh, a month before the election. Floods came in and, and really tore apart the community. And people were talking about how the Trump campaign sent down like $30,000 worth of supplies. Laura Trump, who's from North Carolina, came down. Um, and the, the big Trump bus came down, and there's pictures of it all over social media in North Carolina and Robinson County. And people said on that day, and this is a month before the election, I made up my, my mind to vote for Trump because he recognized us in our time of need. Yeah, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Th these are communities that feel like they're ignored or mocked even by uh, you know, polit political parties and the, the media. And, and so a candidate actually showing up and, you know, on a national level, a candidate, that really, that really goes a long way. You see some resentment and anger among voters. Um, they feel forgotten, and, it, and it maybe some resentment and anger, but also appreciation when a politician does recognize them. All right, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Todd. I'm here attending the Senior Executive for Fellows Program. Um, as a member of the Basket of Deplorables, I appreciate you taking on this um, task to tell the story and what I've heard so far tonight, you're doing a great job of that. Um, but in places like this, academic circles, et cetera, I work for the federal government. I generally don't admit that I'm a member of that group of people because it's met with such hostility, um, et cetera. So I'm wondering, since you live in the DC area and are in the media, if you're facing any backlash and how you're addressing that. Oh, among the people we meet? Mm -hmm. No. No, among no, the people who might be more on the left of issues or oh, been no. Clinton voters. No. I think there, there's an appreciation for what we're doing. Um, and there, there have been a lot of um, journalists from across the spectrum who have, who have gone out and, and, and tried to find out what's going on, Inc and politicians. We've gone places where they say, yeah, there's a, a state assemblyman from California who came through just on a fact-finding mission. So it's sort of, it's sort of, uh, Wait, have, you, have, right you, have you run into Mark Zuckerberg yet? No, <laughs> I haven't, no. Not at the B&B, &B anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that the Holiday Inn. So. But, but also, I remember, and this is, uh, I don't remember exactly what it said. I think it was in the Atlantic or something. There was a headline that said, um, so something like, I'm paraphrasing that, well, this is sort of the, obviously, this is a disaster of a presidency, the worst president ever. But the question is, will America recover? No, um, the Economist. Yeah, the Economist. Yeah, and I and I and I looked at it and I thought, I mean, agree or disagree? I'm just like, they don't, they still don't get it, because, I, you know, if you go out and talk to the average person, what, especially those who who supported him, they don't think that way. And if he gets those people who supported him last time to vote again, it's going to be awful tight. In, in the time you've been out, uh, um, does anybody talk about North Korea, a nuclear war? Is that something that's on people's minds, or is it much more <laughs> domestic? Um, it is. I, I did hear one person who, who had voted for, for Trump who was a bit nervous about that. Other people say, hey, that's exactly what we need. We need somebody who's going to be unpredictable a bit, not telegraphing to our enemies what we're going to do, when we're going to withdraw our army. Um, and so they are, uh, I guess, optimistic that he's doing the right thing. They're giving him a shot. And I think a lot of people applauded what uh, uh, Trump did, about, I think it was a month or two after his election, what he did in Syria when he bombed a couple of the, um, the Russian fighter jets, to send a message. Um, he, and this is people on both ends of the spectrum, and people who, a lot of people who are not, you know, war hawks necessarily. Uh, but I, I have been, just more generally, surprised at how knowledgeable people are and how much they keep up to date on the news. Oftentimes we'll go into a 
somewhere and, and people will be asking us, oh, have you heard what happened today? You know, we won't even know what was going on. We, we were traveling. So people are really up to date on what's going on and they take their news from a variety of sources. I assume they took it from their little echo chamber. You know, oh, I watch Fox and only Fox or only CNN or MSNBC. But people t tend to take it from different sources. They just have a filter when they receive that information. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Hi, my name is James Shipton. I work at the law school here. Um, you speak about the bond between the Trump voters and the president himself. So I'm interested in two things. Firstly, is that bond breakable, particularly amongst the core? And what will it take for that bond to break, again, specifically with the core? Hmm, that's a good question. I guess it depends on how you define the core. Um, I mean, well, take, let's take the 38% or, or the 85% of Republicans who support him okay. today. Well, there are a lot of them who don't, who their support could break, definitely. I think ev eventually people are going to want something accomplished, something big, legislatively. And people voted in a deal maker, somebody who was supposed to be business savvy, somebody who could work with different um, factions within Congress. And so right now everyone's, you know, for the most part giving him the benefit of the, of the doubt. But I think if after, you know, another year, year and a half, if, if things haven't been done, I think it could, it could start to turn, definitely. And a quick follow-up question is sort of, is tax enough? Tax reform? Tax reform enough. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, that would be huge, depending on what they, what, what they uh, decide on. Um, if they can accomplish that in the first year, I think a lot of people would be very happy. It, I, I don't think it, it would take much, because um, I was talking to a guy the other day, and he listed off like 60 things he, he felt Trump has already done. A lot of people do, do think he's, he's, he's done quite a bit, but I think the, even one huge legislative accomplishment will go a long way for him. And I think, I think the administration knows that, too. Uh, of the different counties that you go to, are you hearing a wide variety of, of answers, or are you pre hearing pretty universal statements about Trump wherever you go? Pretty universal. Um, uh, the counties we've been to so far, five of them are Obama-Trump counties. So. They're not, you know, this thing is called Trump's America. You know, it's kind of a misnomer because a lot of these places are, you have a lot of Democrats, a lot of people who voted for Hillary as well. So you, you meet all sorts of people. I think it would be different in if we were like somewhere in the South that just focused on counties that went all in for Trump. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, gentlemen. My name is okay. Dee. I'm from Australia. I'm at the Kennedy School. Um, so you, that was an interesting point you made that uh, both the conservative uh, media and the liberal media both got it wrong uh, on, on, the tr on the election. And obviously with media in general, traditional media, the economics really under a lot of pressure in terms of these assets and you know, shifting to digital. And obviously what's happening in terms of that putting pressure on investigative journalism like yourself. So how can we look at this going forward in terms of the media being able to predict and actually get things accurate when we have this very challenging economics for this industry? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's doing what we're doing, which is getting out there. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't take much, you know, as far as the media is concerned, to get out there and, um, you know, with the multimedia approach of, of getting video content, audio content, photos, articles, all, you know, all together. You know, one person or two people can go out and do that. I, I just think there's an unwillingness to, and I've, I keep going back to this point, but a lot of members of the media, they don't even want to get outside of their, their air, you know, the DMV, as we call it, in, or, or New York, D.C. area. Um, and so there's still a reluctance to get out and to meet people who, you know, they have a vote just like everybody else. And so un until there's more of a desire to do that, you know, there still could be, you know, this, this inability to predict well, elections. And there is a commitment of, of money that, was it the Washington Examiner? Is, are mm -hmm. they paying for this? Sure, yep. All right, so, you know, it gets expensive even though you're probably... Yes, yeah, specialty. Uh, you're, you're you're probably very good at not spending too much money, <laughs> which is something I learned I'm is when I was a foreign correspondent as well. <laughs> By necessity, yes. <laughs> but yeah. you still, that is a, a significant a commitment of, of money and also time, and, and exactly. there's a limited number of, of of media outlets that can probably do that. I guess you're owned by a, a billionaire, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how much money he has, but. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank, Thank you, Dee. Yes. 
guys. Uh, my Hi. name is Austin McKinney. I'm an MBA student over at the business school. Uh, I'm from Wayne County, which is Michigan, yeah. which oh, is yeah. right next to Macomb County. Uh, <clears throat> so I tell people I'm from Detroit because that's where I'm from. And around here, I usually get one of three looks. One is horror. Two is, uh, you know, like unjustified sorrow. And three would be like, thank God you got out of there as soon as possible. Um, which all three lack really any true empathy whatsoever of the situation <laughs> going on uh, in Detroit mm-hmm. and other places around the country. And, but these are uh, here in Cambridge, in San Francisco, places like that that I go. But I, these are people that are capable of profound in- empathy. I've seen them do it with other communities. So I, other than telling the story, how do, we, how do we get people in these very successful parts of the country to understand and empathize with people? Well, I, I have one word, travel. You know, it's, all, it's funny because I talk to a lot of people. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're from England originally, and we travel around, and people say, oh, Americans don't travel outside the country. Well, there are a lot of Americans who do travel, but they don't often travel within their country to places like Detroit, which, by the way, even though Detroit is outside of Macomb County, we've heard a lot of positive things about yeah, the comeback Yeah, a lot Detroit. of people are moving. We met a lot of Macomb County residents who, are, who, who moved out of Detroit north to Macomb, to yeah. Warren and, and Sterling Heights, and now a few of them say they're moving back to Detroit. Yeah, there's a some research. of the some of them are moving back because they because Trump won in Macomb and they don't feel welcome. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some obviously some exciting stuff going on there and other places. And I just I wonder like, how do we build that understanding? I if think they consider it flyover country, right? They're never going to go. I, I think they make a great point. I'm I'm a reporter based in New Orleans. I, I cover Louisiana politics. And I, I really going out and talking to people and getting uh, there's really no substitute for that. And um, I, I often hear, as everyone here would, the complaints about the media being too liberal. Uh, my sense of having been a reporter for a while covering politics is it's a sort of the group think. It's sort of thinking too much alike. And I think that that kind of leads to kind of the thinking that the kinds of things that people are saying about where you're from. Yeah, and it's not, it's not that hard. I mean, we were just in West Virginia uh, yesterday, and it's two and a half, it's two and a half hour drive from Northern Virginia where a lot of people live. They would never think of going to West Virginia. I w- we went out there, it's a beautiful day, and I'm like, man, I can't wait to come back here. It's beautiful out there, the people are genuine, and you know, I, I think doing that will really go a long way, getting out and traveling. And there are a lot of places, I always say, well, you know, my, Des Moines, Iowa. Well, how about the cities and the towns and the villages that people have never heard of? Those are the places you should go because you really have an experience out there. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Avi Nelson, my uh, career was in radio and television. <clears throat> Trump has had a sometimes uncomfortable relationship with the truth, has said things that have outraged people, made the comment during the campaign that he could commit a murder in the middle of New York and he his, wouldn't lose his supporters. Gets back to the point that you made earlier that there's almost a cult following people attached to the candidate and then connect with the issues. The question is, can you give any explanation for that, any understanding of how this happens? It sounds like it's a very important phenomenon in politics, but it doesn't sound like it's well understood. Why is it that people will gravitate to a man like Trump, irrespective of what he believes in, and then after they've connected with him, say, ah, yes, well, I I go along with some of his views as well. Wow, I think that would take a psychologist or something to get into, but um, one thing I do know is that he, he did, a lot of people say he says the things that I think, and he can get away with it. And no, he's, he approaches issues, he talks about issues like nobody else. And again, but, also but they, also, they also know that other candidates think it. They know that everybody thinks certain things that sometimes is disagreeable. But he's the only one willing to say it. And, and they connect with that for some reason. Yeah. You know, what you were just saying, that they, 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 years ago I covered David Duke in Louisiana, and, and white people would say to me, who were Duke supporters, that, that he says the things that we say around the kitchen table, but we don't want to say publicly. Is that what they're saying as well? Or? Some of that. I mean, I've heard it time and again. He's not politically correct. Also... He has what they call fuck you money. He, he did, he did, what do you call that? Fuck you money. <laughs> <laughs> he, during the campaign, he was not bought and sold. He didn't need to ask for money from, from anyone. And 
people respect that. Not just because he has money, but because he's not tied to anything. He couldn't be bought. He couldn't be bought. And people looked at him and they said, this guy's 70 years old. He's famous, money, powerful. He's probably going to die in the next 10 years. I mean, like, he's, you know, he's, oh, oh, he's not going to be around forever. He doesn't need to be president. But he's, so they felt like he was running because he really did want to do something. Whereas they looked at Hillary and said, her whole life has been focused, staying with Bill, everything she's done has been focused on becoming the first woman president. And she'll do anything to become that. Whereas they looked at Trump and said, well, he's got everything. He's done so many, you know, accomplished a lot. And, and so they felt like he was a bit more sincere in that way. All right, great. Uh, may, this may be the last question. But I'll, I've got a couple I want to ask, but go, go for it. Um, my name's Ira. I'm doing a non-degree program here, um, but I'm from the UK. I wondered um, whether you come across a lot of people who abstain from voting um, and what their sentiments are, whether it's regret or whatever. Um, and related to that, um, if, there's, if you sense there's a shift in people um, of the importance of voting, um, whether there's a shift in how hmm. people perceive their, their right to vote? Well, one thing is we found, yeah, some people abstain, and others actually voted, Democrats who supported Bernie Sanders voted for Trump, not thinking, because of the media, maybe, that he would win, so hey, let's just send a message. So that actually bodes well for you know, the Democrats next time around, because now these voters might say, wait a second, we have to actually vote, not to send a message, but to elect whoever we think is you know, the best candidate. But yeah, we did come across that, um, uh, especially obviously on the Democratic side. Yeah. What was the second part of your question? Sorry. Um, whether you sense there's a uh, kind of shift in the importance um. or the value um, people assign to their ro right to vote, especially people who perhaps abstain from voting because they don't think either candidate really <laughs> represented them, whether now that they've seen the consequences, whether sure. they agree or not with it, whether it's... That's to be honest, we haven't talked a lot about that, but that would be an interesting question. Mm. We, we should add that to the list. <laughs> and, and I think people feel like, wow, both establishments on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, and you know, the mainstream media, people say, we're against this one candidate, and he won. So that, that's, that says that maybe democracy is in a better state than we think, that somebody who uh, all the institutions were against, he still won. So maybe that, that will sort of underscore the importance of, of getting involved in voting in the future. Great. Uh, I want to wind up with a couple of quick questions. Uh, the first was, uh, what's next for you guys? Where, where's the, where do you go next? Uh, and how, you know. um, Volusia County, Florida, which is in Daytona. Um, as it gets cold in the north, we go south. We go south. <laughs> yeah. Get out of the Midwest. Um, so we'll be there. That was another flip county that went from Obama to Trump. Um, helped him win, win Florida. Then out to two counties that went the other way, um, historically Republican, and then voted for Hillary. Salt Lake County, Utah, which uh, voted, went for Hillary in part because Evan McMullen, who's, who's from Utah and is a Mormon, uh, got 19% of the vote there, but also because Mormons care about character. And a lot of them didn't vote for Trump because you know, they thought he was a bad hurting. character. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how they respond to the Trump presidency as it unfolds, scandals come about things, you know, are happening in the White House, so. But, I, but if the project is, is Trump's America, why would you go to a county that, that flipped to Hillary? Well, it's, it's actually called the race to 2020. Okay. Um, so, but it, it is sort of a, we, we can follow these, these places to see, to get a good idea how these important count, counties are interpreting what's happening in Washington. The other county is Orange County, California, which, again, historically, one of the few places in California that's uh, Republican and Trump lost uh, there to Hillary, uh, in part because of an influx of Hispanic immigrants. All right, final question. Uh, tell everybody where they can find your work. Uh, 2020.WashingtonExaminer.com. We have a Facebook page that we're just starting to build up, and people can interact with us there. Instagram, Twitter as well, we're starting to build, and obviously we have another three years to do that, so. All right, well, Dan. Jordan, you guys have been a great uh, panelist, great questions by the audience. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming you. <laughs>